everything that the Republicans are doing is designed to make you give up, make you become fatalist, make you feel it's not worth it because they're going to come in anyway. And that's why when Kevin Roberts says, we are going to win, we're coming in. It's designed, it's like a steamroller. And that's what all authoritarians do. Sometimes they, they're like Mussolini, the first one, he was already using violence, like copious violence. So that scared people into silence. So we have a chance to turn this around. Why can't we be like France or the UK? But we've got to get people to vote. And welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Well, as we discussed with Supreme Court expert Dahlia Lithwick last week, we have slipped into some pretty new territory in the United States, where the Supreme Court has now given the American president the power of kings, with the ability to sit above the law. To paraphrase Dahlia herself, we have moved out of the world of those who have expertise on the courts and into the wheelhouse of those who have expertise in tyranny. So with that in mind, today we're going to be talking to Ruth ben Giat, author of Strongmen, From Mussolini to the Present, a literal expert on the rise of heads of state who damage and destroy democracy and promise law and order rule only to legitimize lawless behavior by themselves and their inner circle. A professor of history and Italian studies at NYU, Ruth is also an advisor to protect democracy and the recipient of the Guggenheim and other fellowships. The author of the Lucid newsletter on Substack about the abuses of power and how to counter them, Ruth is also a regular columnist and writer for MSNBC, CNN, Washington Post, and The Atlantic, and a regular commentator on mainstream media about authoritarianism and the threats to democracy around the world. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, professor, author, and expert on authoritarianism, Ruth ben Giat. Welcome back, Ruth. Thank you. So glad to be here. Well, thanks for coming back. I wanted to have you on for months, but you've been busy working on your new book. But with this new decision from the Supreme Court putting the American president, uh, but Donald Trump specifically above the law, there was no way that I couldn't get you on to talk about where we sit at this moment in history. Yeah, it's like seeing a textbook on authoritarianism come to life. And the fact that the Supreme Court accepted to hear the case, I I had written in my substack about this, that it already having discussions like, oh, would the president be immune if a SEAL team came and, you know, he ordered assassination of his political opponents? Just having that discussion before the court with Trump's lawyer already was normalizing the idea in the American public's mind because it was covered by the by the press. And then we had the decision that made it, you know, official. But it's part of this kind of information warfare and legal warfare that entwine to normalize autocracy. And many things the Supreme Court has been doing are kind of laying the legal foundations for autocracy and most of all, making the head of state immune from prosecution, even for violent acts, which is the dream of every autocrat. And it's why Trump admires Xi and Putin and the leader of North Korea, because they have what, you know, he wanted and now he has it too, if he comes back to the White House. Yeah. If he comes back to the White House, it doesn't help that we also made bribery of politicians and judges legal, that we gutted the ability for federal agencies to do their jobs. I mean, like you said, they're laying the groundwork for the next type strongman leader. And if it's Trump, we know he will take full advantage of it. When you wrote Strongman, you wrote about all these heads of state who use their masculinity as a tool of political legitimacy. And then they come in and they damage, or in the case of a second Trump term, they destroy democracy democracy, promising to fix everything and return a lawless land to a lawful one. But they really just end up giving themselves and their inner circle the power to act above the law. I mean, you have covered in your books centuries of tyrannical rule and all the tactics you talk about that keep authoritarians in power, like propaganda, corruption, violence, even vitality, the vitality of the man himself. And I think that keeps coming back to what this Biden is an old man thing um, and Trump is some swaggering powerhouse that's happening right now. That's all part of a kind of an authoritarian playbook. And while I might expect it from the Republicans and the MAGA base, it seems like the media and even some of the Democrats are helping their case at a time where they really should not be. 
You know, this you, you touched on so many things there. So I want to just say two things. One is a general thing about authoritarianism, which is the conversion of the rule of law into rule by the lawless. And the essential like core of authoritarianism, it, it's about taking the rights of the many away. So voting rights, reproductive rights, you know, rights that affect millions and millions of people. So take their rights away, but give more rights to the cronies and the leader so they can do lawless things. And so you legalize the lawlessness. So you make plundering, you know, female bodies. So that Trump in his first term, he partly decriminalized domestic violence. You make it easier through privatization and anti-union, like union busting to plunder the workforce. And this is also the Supreme Court. You make it easier to plunder the environment. So the elite and the leader and his cronies have fewer uh, regulations and restrictions placed on them. Whereas the mass of people have more restrictions, what they can do, even their own bodies, if they're women. So that's like the underlying dynamic. And it's really scary to see this playing out with such like efficiency now by the GOP, the laws at the state level and the Supreme Court and all the rhetoric from from Trump and all of his lackeys in the GOP. It's really astounding. It's like seeing my book come to life in America. Yeah. It's it's quite astounding. As far as the second part of your comments about the media and Biden, something can happen, and it did happen in Italy after Berlusconi was around, who was a Putin puppet, an entertainer. He had a personality cult. No one was better than Berlusconi in seducing the media, seducing the public, being entertaining. And leadership came like it was as though like the ideal of leadership became this kind of performer who had charisma, who knew just what to say to people, no matter that he brought fascists into the government, no matter that he excused Putin doing what he was doing in Georgia in 2008. What mattered is that performance was entertaining and it got clicks. And so you can have that kind of degradation of norms, of ideals about leadership. And I think that's part of what has happened here. And instead of Berlusconi, it's Trump, who is a superb entertainer, a superb propagandist. He's he's macho. He's this. He's that. He has all the best women. He has a personality cult. And so, you know, there was a time, remember, where people were saying that Biden was boring because democracy is boring. <laughs> democracy is about people who are dedicated to being, you know, objective civil servants, not politicized, about going to doing and doing the work in the interests of good governance. It's not about lying in seductive ways. And that debate, it was not a debate because one person showed up to educate the American people with accurate information on on the issues. Now he didn't have he he, he was ill, he didn't feel good, he didn't do well. The other person showed up to seduce the public with lies told in a dynamic manner. You talked about vitality told in a macho manner, and he was deemed the winner of the debate. And that is a symptom of what I'm describing, that somehow Trumpian and Berlusconian strongmen aesthetics of leadership have swayed people to think that that should be the default now. And if you don't match up to that, you're not really like a, a, a male leader. And that's very sad. It's like Putin shirtless on a horse, these sort of macho supermen. And it doesn't matter that what they're saying is absolutely atrocious or ridiculous or what Trump did in the debate, which was just lie in such a fast speed. I think there's even a name for it, the way he lied like that so, so fast that your opponent can't possibly figure out which lie to hit first. So you end up, the opponent ends up looking confused rather because, but they're mostly just confused with like how many lies just came at them at the same time. And without the help of the moderators, it's a very difficult right. uh, way to manage that sort of a situation. In fact, because this wasn't a debate and there also was no fact checking, you, I, I, you know, I study propaganda, you must have on the spot real time fact checking. Once the lie is told, and if it's told over and over again, becomes familiar. So in that debate, no matter who was there, plug in the person you think would have done better. 
they would have been forced to be on the defensive, refuting the lies the whole time. And that would take away from their time for, for presenting their ideas and achievements to the American people. So that person, it was Biden, was placed in an impossible situation. And indeed, ironically, Biden showed at the end of the debate that he understood perfectly well what had gone on, better than most of the media, because he said, it's hard to debate a liar. That was one of the first, his first like hot takes, because you he was placed in a situation of either he would be the fact checker and thus wouldn't be able to say positive things about his achievements, or he would, you know, what happened to him is he didn't respond well at all. And it's an impossible situation. Yeah. Which is why people are asking for some, you know, 30 year old JFK, you know, wannabe coming in there who can just swoop in and say, you're a liar and I don't believe you and do it in some dynamic way. But we don't have that. These are our two candidates right now. And one is a chronic liar who wants to be a strong man and the other one will hold up our democracy. And we need to keep that in mind because ultimately I think it feels like this is no longer just about Trump. It's about the authoritarian rise around the world. It's about the authoritarian manifesto that is Project 2025. It's about a sweeping conservative Christian takeover of this country and all levels of government and a Supreme Court who's making decisions to make this kind of a takeover easier. So I don't think we should just be sitting on who the candidates are. We must talk about this plan to consolidate the entire federal government around the next Republican president. Those are the things we need to be talking about because that's what a strong man does. They bring in something bigger than themselves. And it's an entire new way of doing government. Absolutely. Very, you know, perfectly put. Yeah. Project 2025, and note the deceptively neutral name they have chosen. These people know what they're doing. Is a project to redesign government to be an autocracy, to support autocracy. And so everything about it, starting with the very frightening, um, there's many frightening things in it, but the idea of the head of state it says that there's a need for there's an existential need for an aggressive use of the vast powers of the executive branch now existential need is classic like strongmen like there's a crisis we need the strongman to fix everything and then aggressive that's like gesturing toward the use of force and so this is what authoritarianism is when the executive overwhelms or politicizes or shuts down in some neutralizes in some way the other branches of government especially the judiciary and so so that's one red flag another of course is having these mass purges of of civil service including the judiciary so that and they have a presidential training academy that's been going on for some time to create what they called you know vetted loyal conservatives and another red flag is they keep talking about day one like when the coup is going to start up again. So they say they're going to be preparing already vetted, loyal people to like kick off everything on day one. And so the idea of an impartial civil servant who serves the American people, serves the Constitution, is out the window. It has to be loyal to Trump. And that's what happens in autocracies. You know, you need the cult of the leader and the leader with the extra power. You need the thugs on the ground. And that's what Kevin Roberts, the head of Heritage, which is, you know, shepherding Project 2025, made that scary comment recently. He's made it several times saying it's the revolution and it'll be bloodless if the left allows it to be. So there's the gesturing toward the idea that like the Heritage Foundation doesn't have an in-house paramilitary, as far as I know. It's a think tank. So he's saying that they're aligned with all these, you know, proud boys, militias, God knows who else. Who they will unleash on us if we fight back. Exactly. So you need the leader who has unrestrained power and now immunity. You need the thugs on the ground. And then you need the people in suits in the offices implementing the things. And Hannah Arendt called them desk killers. Now, she was referring to the the people who signed the papers for the Holocaust and before, putting people into Dachau in the 1930s. But you need all those layers of people. And that's what Project 2025 is, is to create a compliant civil service and a compliant government so that the executive and his cronies can do whatever they want. 
Yeah. And the Supreme Court just gave them freedom to do that. Because if you, if the president can do whatever they want, and the president can do it all within their official duties, anything they ask someone to do within their official duties would also be under that blanket of immunity. And if it's not under that blanket of immunity, if I say, hey, go kill this person for me, but I am immune, I also have the power of the pardon as the president, which is the most ludicrous, circular, Putin-esque type thing where you take away your, you know, where people fall out of windows and go to gulags and then suddenly starve to death or are ill and then die. You know, this is the kind of America we are looking at if people don't get really serious really fast about it. And and I think we also need to talk about the fact that Trump and Project 2025's plan is this mass deportation of 15 to 20 million people, which is a classic, as you say, fascist or communist tactic that will lead to absolute chaos in this country. And do you want to just talk me a little bit through that? Because they're talking about 5% of the country's entire population. Like that will not go well. Yeah. I started trying to think comparatively about that because that's, you know, my area is global authoritarianism. And then I try and look at the U.S. with that lens and it's the scale of 15, let's, let's settle on 15 million. Trump says 15 to 20 in his interview to Time Magazine. Project 2025 sometimes says 10 to 15. So 15 million people. That is more, people need to realize, like imagine this is more than the population of Cuba, of Haiti, of Belgium, of Portugal, of Sweden. It's, they would be deporting the population of entire countries in the world. In World War II, within Europe, 65 million people were displaced or or deported in all of World War II. This is almost one third of that number. That's how big a mass movement we're talking about. So that's the scale, almost 5% of the U.S. population. Now, the other thing that we need to think about is when you make pronouncements of that sort, you make them because you want to justify allocating resources of the state away from, of course, like social assistance programs, things we actually need, to what we call the infrastructure of repression. Where are you going to? Where are these people going to go? How are they going to get to these transit camps and these other camps? Once you build those camps, other types of people can be put in them. That's the other point. Like when the Nazis started, you know, rounding up Jews, they didn't just round up Jews. They rounded up anybody who was an anti-fascist, not just leftists, also liberals. They put Jehovah's Witnesses in and they kept expanding the numbers of people. They put gay people in. And so they built Dachau because they ran out of space in the warehouses and normal prisons. So what I'm saying is they're they're making this impossibly large uh, but real idea of 15 million people so they can justify building, an, it must be an enormous infrastructure of prisons. And you can be assured that although they're saying the, the 15 million will be undocumented immigrants, other types of people will be put there because they're also telling us that other types of people will be put there. When Trump says in speeches, he talks about people as vermin, he's actually not mentioning sometimes undocumented workers. He's mentioning, you know, Democrats, fascists, he calls them Marxists, you know, all the people we know who are going to be persecuted. So that's that's the problem. You You create these kind of repressive spaces for one group. And then people might say, well, I'm not an undocumented immigrant, so I'm not going to care. I'm not going to vote. You know, I can vote for Trump because I'm not going to get in trouble. But that's not how history works. Once you have the camps, other people go into them. Yeah. If you build it, they will come kind of a situation, right? Again, perfect. Yes. Yeah. And also, I think people want to, you know, there's a lot of people who are voting for their wallets. And I want to say, listen, who's paying 
for these camps? Who's paying for the staff at these camps? Who's paying to build the camps? Who's paying to ship all these people on planes out of the nation? Are we now a giant human trafficking organization shipping people to where? Around the world. So then America creates an international crisis. And once those people are all gone, who goes in those camps after that? And that's anyone else who speaks up, who says, no, you know, you're creating a society of fear and terror. And we have so many historical references to see that happening. And I just want people to imagine like how terrifying mass sweeps of deputized, racist, xenophobic law enforcement officers would be in this country. It is so incredibly anti-American. It is the idea of Nazis walking the street, terrifying people. We have them doing it right now in American cities, shouting Sig Heil and deportation saves the nation, you know? And this is this is where we're really at. And I think people need to really get their heads around what moment in history we sit in. Now, obviously, Trump is trying to distance himself from Project 2025 right now, when it's pathetically obvious that his presidency and that plan are the same. He might have nothing to do with the actual writing of Project 2025 because the man has no real ideas and he doesn't do any actual work. But he didn't pick those Supreme Court justices. They were installed. Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society picked those justices. He didn't write Project 2025. The Heritage Foundation with a bunch of his staffers and loyalists wrote it. Donald Trump wants power, but he will let the smarter, more organized people around him actually do the work until they get in his way and then he has the power to get rid of them. Today's episode is brought to you by Lumen. Lumen is the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. And on the app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workout, sleep, and even stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your Lumen first thing in the morning, and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fat or carbs. Then Lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals so you know exactly what's going on with your body in real time and Lumen will give you the tips to get you at the top of your health game. Your metabolism is your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food you eat into fuel that keeps you going. And at the end of the day, your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does and optimal metabolic health means easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, and even better sleep. And for the record, you can also track your cycle, as well as the onset of menopause and adjust your recommendations to keep your metabolism healthy through hormonal shifts so you can keep your energy up and stave off cravings. I think that all sounds incredibly helpful. So if you want to take the next step to improving your health, go to lumen.me slash politics girl to get 15% off your lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N dot me slash politics girl for 15% off your purchase. Thank you, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode. Okay, so now that it's the summer, we're more aware of our bodies and how our bodies fit in clothes, especially if we're doing exercise in the heat. If something is uncomfortable or too tight in the wrong places or it stretches out too fast, then there's going to be a problem. I've talked a lot about Roan for men, but Roan now has an entire selection of clothing for women. In fact, the new Roan Course to Court collection is an extremely comfortable, breathable and versatile collection of active wear. So whether you're into tennis, pickleball or golf, Roan has made sure that not only does everything look good and work well with things like hidden liners, drop-in pockets and chafe-free seams, they've used luxe fabrics like Cosmic Knit and Celestial Knit as their foundations, which gives the freedom of movement and breathability but with optimal performance. Also, like their men's line, the clothes are treated with Gold Fusion, an anti-odor technology, so you can know you're fresh and clean all day long. Check out Roan's women's collection and see if your summer athletics fit couldn't use a bit of an upgrade. Roan's course to court collection can get you through the workday and straight into whatever comes next. Head to roan.com slash politics girl and use the promo code politics girl to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash politics girl and use the code politics girl. As they say at Roan, for every day, for every you, forever forward. So this month, I'm talking about one of my favorite new podcasts, Vibes. What if I told you that the fate of democracy hinges on vibes? 
I get it, that sounds horrifying, but it's the concept behind one of the newest podcasts called Vibes Only. What my friends at Courier are getting at with this is that most of us don't have the time to study policy proposals or economic reports all day, but what we do have are vibes, how we feel about the direction of the country. So in this election season, where democracy is on the ballot, co-host Brian Derrick and Glennis Muhar are committed to checking the vibes of American politics every week and bridging the divide between our facts and our feelings. It's funny, it's informative, the two of them have a great vibe, and like this show, it will make you better prepared for the election this fall. Listen and subscribe to Vibes Only wherever you get your podcasts. I think you will find it is worth your time, because those courier people, they really know what they're doing. Vibes Only. Subscribe where you can. Donald Trump wants power, but he will let the smarter, more organized people around him actually do the work until they get in his way, and then he has the power to get rid of them. Yes, that, that's exactly right. But I also want to point out that so the Heritage Foundation was always thought of as like a conservative think tank. It's a very rich, very powerful think tank. This is before they became now, you know, in the public eye for Project 2025. And Kevin Roberts, the Dr. Kevin Roberts, he always wears a suit and tie. He went on MSNBC recently and he said, and I was there backstage because I was rebutting him after in a different segment. He said, we tell the truth with a smile on our face. This chilled me almost more than anything he said, because that's the most fascist thing in the world to say that you tell the truth, well, they're, they're telling lies, but with a smile on your face. And he was trying to kind of uh, say it wasn't about Trump. And indeed, as you pointed out, it's not only about Trump, but he is, and Project 2025, these are extremists, and he's very tight with Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon is now in jail, but Kevin Roberts goes on the war room a lot. My point I'm making is there's like one degree of separation between Bannon, the Proud Boys, the neo-Nazis, and what we thought of as the institutional conservative think tank of the Heritage Foundation. They're the same. And indeed, the next day, after he appeared on MSNBC, Kevin Roberts went on Steve Bannon's war room. It was one of the last shows before he went to jail and talked about how everybody was lying at MSNBC. I was mentioned because apparently my rebuttal irritated him. So don't fall for the idea that Bannon and extremists are one thing, and these are just um, think tankers who are re you know, redefining government. They are extremists and they're all MAGA. So we have to get clear about that because it's a mass movement of extremists. That's, that's why another reason we have to take this very seriously. Yeah. And I have to tell you, I think the, the fact that you used the word chilling is exactly it because I watched that Kevin Roberts interview and I watched it, the original one, it was with Michael Steele and Simone Sanders yes. and, and Michael Steele was a member of that organization for yes. a long time. It was a very serious conservative think tank. And listening to him, I found the entire thing chilling because he was so clear eyed and serious and presenting like a normal person, not presenting like a zealot or a uh, Trumpish. He was very serious, but everything he said was truly terrifying. At one point he said, we believe wholly in women's rights, especially women's rights in the womb. And he said it in such a, it was such a throwaway comment. And I thought, here's the thing. These people are the most extreme of extremists. He's just in a very conservative, acceptable costume, but he may as well, you know, open up his head and have the monster come out because he is a chilling man. And Steve Bannon has from the very beginning said he's a Leninist, that he wants to burn America to the ground and build his own nation on top of it. And these people are completely aligned. So obviously we don't have the luxury of losing to Trump or any of these monsters, but the American media, like we were talking about before, and the Democrats themselves are currently undermining in my mind, the successful incumbent president who has the best chance of 
fighting back against this because it's such a clear dichotomous picture. These are bad guys. This is a good guy. And watching them sort of take shots at the good guy at the very time we need them to be rallying behind him alarms me. So what is your take on what I believe is the most short-sighted move on the planet, this Biden too old, Biden should step down forced error that a lot of people uh, seem to be making right now? Because it just seems like the most idiotic move uh, when this much is on the line. So in my area, we, we talk about outcome arguments okay. and we use it both to warn people of the dangers of authoritarianism. For example, you mentioned before people who say, well, all I care about is that, you know, my bottom line of my company, all I care about is the price of gas. I don't care about politics. So outcome arguments there, you say, well, guess what? Look around the world. Authoritarianism is ruinous for the economy. It, and that's why everybody flees, like Turkey, Hungary, people are fleeing in record numbers. They plunder businesses. The leader and his cronies just like start plundering you know, private business. So that's an outcome argument. But we can also use outcome arguments for this situation where you know, the record of the Biden administration, and by the way, we like to do the great man of history and it's all about the president, but administrations are about who the president and vice president appoint to be capable people. And so it's a whole collective, the outcome of a presidency is, is a collective work. And that, that record, it speaks for itself. Biden has, Biden administration has produced more benefits economically, more jobs, more things that make everyday life better for millions and millions of people, whether it's relieving student loan debt or the price of insulin or all the other big scale, you know, large scale reforms that he has done. It's astounding what he has done. So that's an outcome argument that you can use and say, has in fact Biden been a failure? And I mean, if you're listening to Fox News and you are actually equipped in your head with false statistics about crime, false statistics about everything, you would say yes. <laughs> but if you know the facts, Biden has performed magnificently. And yes, he will be older, but he's not alone. This is, again, you know, this framework where it's all about the big man, which is also wrong. It's, it's short-sighted and wrong. It's not really how politics works. So I've been appalled at this. And the fact that the New York Times published 192 pieces, uh, an independent journalist uh, did a tally in a very short period of time against Biden, right? And then they had that op-ed, uh, sorry, editorial board thing, which is very serious. They don't do those very often. The day after the debate, saying he should step aside. And you know how, um, like when someone is important, there's an obituary that's written about them waiting to go in a newspaper. You know, you have people who write these obituaries ahead of time and then they just roll them out. I felt like that had happened. They had been gunning for Biden already. There's many studies now. Media Matters has a study. I just found a study by a computational lab at Penn of political scientists showing how the age question has been skewed hugely that you don't talk about it for Trump, you talk about it for Biden. And this uh, University of Pennsylvania study is from March 2024. So this is a trend that was already going on. And you, you will, many of you will have witnessed that, like the, the skewed coverage. And then the debate happened, which was not really a debate as we've gone over. And so the next day it starts, right? They, they had it ready to um, go. It, it, yes. And so it's the reason that matters is because if you contrast the level of aggression, and it's not just the times, I just use that as an example. It's much, much broader. If you contrast the achievements of the Biden administration, which is being blamed, I believe, partly because it's a truly progressive administration that, re, that reflects America's aspirations as a multiracial democracy. And some people apparently are not on board with that. <laughs> they don't really want that. And so if you contrast all the achievements of Biden's actual administration with the rapidity and aggression of the calls for him to just disappear, supposed to just disappear, there's something off there. Yeah. 
It feels off to me too. Something feels really wrong. It just, it, it, it's leaving out so many aspects of that, that like another candidate couldn't win. You couldn't necessarily get another candidate on the ballot. The Republicans are already prepared to fight it in court. We know the Supreme Court will already go the Republicans way. Like you just don't change course at this point. You just, the train's going too fast. You jump off now, you die. Honestly, I don't understand the argument. I'm finding it very frustrating. It's both men are not ideal candidates, but one is a monster and one is a good man, and I don't know what we're doing. The Republican Party allowed Trump to come to power knowing who he was. The mainstream media allowed Trump to stay in the running knowing who he is. The Democrats are now fighting amongst themselves knowing what's at stake. So what would you suggest regular people do? to fight back, to hold on to their democracy, to do what, you know, the Germans might have done in 1938, that kind of thing. What would you recommend we do right now? Voting. Voting is the core of everything. And they're saying they might not accept the results. And so that's designed to also make people think it's useless to vote. And what we've seen actually around the world very recently in elections is the power of voting. Look what happened in the UK. They voted out this corrupt and incompetent conservative government and put in labor at historic levels of voting. So it's not just what they did, it's the numbers of people who voted. Then we have France, which, you know, had a two round uh, system. So first round of voting, it looked like, uh, you know, the, the far right did really well. That frightened people. And what did the opposition do? They united and they were very, very smart because in the 1930s in France, there was a, the, it was called the Popular Front. And it was a coalition of all the non-fascist parties, uh, all the progressive parties, centrist left parties to fight fascism. And here in this case, they called it the New Popular Front. So they channeled the spirit of that anti-fascist unity And what happened? They were victorious. And this is because people came out and voted. Way too many Americans don't vote. I mean, in both uh, 2016 and 2020, it was something like 60 to 80 million people didn't vote. I'm very haunted by this. So the best thing we can do is not only vote ourselves, anybody listening to this show is likely a voter, but truly, whether it means you're going to phone bank, you're going to canvas, you're going to work for voter registration. It is the most important thing you can do because everything that the Republicans are doing is designed to make you give up, make you become fatalist, make you feel it's not worth it because they're going to come in anyway. And that's why when Kevin Roberts says, we are going to win, we're coming in. It's designed, it's like a steamroller. And that's what all authoritarians do. Sometimes they, they're they like Mussolini, the first one, he was already using violence, like copious violence. So that scared people into silence. So we have a chance to turn this around. Why can't we be like France or the UK? But we've got to get people to vote. And one of the liabilities is that we haven't had, we haven't had a Nazi occupation like France. We haven't had an experience of dictatorship like Brazil. And so people, you know, this is one of the themes of our of our conversation. People just don't take it seriously. And when we talk about deporting and camps, they think, even though these things, uh, you know, at the border, there are already horrible things going on. It's easy to turn away. Voting is the basis for everything right now. Yeah. And we have to remind ourselves that Trump is not going to be some isolationist president. He is aligned with the dictators of the world. The mission is to destroy America through chaos and repression, as Steve Bannon said, to burn it all down, to pull out of NATO, to have the autocrats of the world win. And the autocrats of the world are out here on board with that, right? They're acting as if they're the only ones that can bring peace to the world. Orban is saying it. Putin is saying it. She is saying it that imperialism is the only way to bring order, that we all need these strong men who they alone can fix it, as if the autocrats of the world are not the ones threatening the world order. Putin has come out and said that he supports Trump and Trump's Ukraine peace plan, despite the fact that we have no idea what that peace plan is, except for the fact that Trump will give Putin everything he wants. Investigative journalist Dave Troy recently wrote that Trump is Putin's pick, that Trump has fealty to Putin. 
Putin can then direct Trump to do anything he wants. And then Dave Troy, who knows what he's talking about, wrote checkmate. And I think that's what they're hoping for. They're hoping for checkmate on America. They're hoping for that. We will destroy America without firing a single shot. We will destroy you from within has finally come to fruition. So clearly Donald Trump cannot win this election in November. Everyone must come out and vote against, as France did, the idea of rising fascism, the idea of Nazism, the idea of a strongman leader and a hateful, bigoted leader. Because honestly, we have to imagine a lawless American president beholden to a foreign adversary who sits above the law. And that is a terrifying proposition. Absolutely. And and we have to be very conscious of what I call the upside down world of authoritarianism. Mussolini was the first, and it goes all the way up to Putin to say that democracy is the real tyranny, that fascism is freedom, and this kind of reversing everything, inverting everything. So uh, in 2022, Putin started talking about, he and she were already talking about multipolarity. That's their buzzword. And they were presenting themselves as the forces for justice in the world against American imperialism. And this started in 2021 when they first got together. And now it's it's developed to this discourse of peace. And so do you remember that ad that uh, was like talking about Trump, you know, becoming famous because he was going to restore the Reich? It was like a Nazi ad, like yeah. he was like the new Hitler. Yeah. There's a whole segment in it where Trump is presented as a peacemaker. He's the one who can guarantee peace in the world. This is something that's been coming, and you're going to hear this incessantly. And you're hearing it, in fact, from Xi, from Putin, now from Orban, because he just went to Moscow, and he's you know meeting up with also with Xi. And they're all presenting themselves as the peacemakers and democracies as the forces for conflict in the world. So if you're in the, what I call the disinformation tunnel, and and then, you know, the Murdoch papers, Sinclair, all of these international circuits of false ideas, you could actually be led to vote for Trump thinking he's the force of peace. He's the force of justice and freedom. In fact, you know, January 6th has now been converted into a kind of liberation movement. And that's why uh, the thugs who are in jail for assaulting the Capitol are like freedom fighters. They're hostages. They're patriots. So be very aware of this inversion and perversion of language because the, the goal is to get you to vote against your interests by voting in Trump, thinking he's going to have you know peace in the world. And instead, his mission is to allow the autocrats to do whatever they want. And you'll have the invasion of Taiwan. You know, you have all kinds of chaos in the world. Yeah. Well, it goes back to what Kevin Roberts said, right? You know, if yeah. if the left allows it, it will be bloodless. The world will be yeah. peaceful if you allow the autocrats to take what they want without fighting back. Of course, there's a lot of peace. If I can just take Ukraine and you don't fight back, then there's peace. That's the kind of peace they're talking about. Give me everything I want and don't fight back. There, we're peaceful. I think that inversion and perversion of language is exactly the way to think of it. Like, think about how you are being tricked into thinking one thing when it's truly another. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today, Ruth. I know how busy you are. Um, you're clearly in probably the midst of, like you said, living through your own book. But please tell people <laughs> where they can find your work and buy your books and support the fight against the strong men of the world. So my book, Strongman, that's the authoritarian playbook. It's the first book to include machismo and this kind of male dominating figure up with propaganda, with violence and corruption. So definitely, uh, I, I wish it were outdated, but uh, sadly, it's very relevant. And it was the first book to have Trump in the book in the context of a century of authoritarian history. You can also find my writings at my Substack newsletter, Lucid. I'm usually very early with things that then later come into the mainstream media because I know how these guys think. So I'm, I'm often really early. And so people who uh, follow Lucid have the first scoop on things such as the beginning of this idea that autocrats are the real anti-imperialist fighters. So that's where I do a lot of my writing. And I have live Q&As every week. So you can ask me questions. And it's a whole community that has formed. So those are the main places. Yeah, I read, I read your Lucid newsletter and it is excellent. As you said the last time you were here, it's important that we acknowledge the truth. 
and we admit the problem and we fight against it with everything we have. And as I said last time you were here, if you were ever proud of America for defeating the Nazis in 1945, then you have to vote for the Democrats in 2024 because that same fascist movement is alive and well in the American Republican Party, in the American conservative movement. And just like its historical ancestors, we have to soundly destroy it. Truer than ever. Thank you, Ruth. So that was Ruth ben Giat reminding us that the conservative movement is redesigning our government to support autocracy, that it's not just about the leader, but about converting the rule of law to a rule by the lawless, taking the rights of the many away and giving more rights to the inner circle and the leader themselves. That our opposition to fascism must unite us. Not only so we vote against this dystopian future, but we make sure those who aren't paying attention, who aren't registered, who don't vote, truly understand what is at stake this year. I want to thank Ruth for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now let's stop talking about the president's age and start talking about what happens if Trump becomes president. That is fundamentally more important. Until next week, PGM. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.